Yeah, when we're using our multimeter, we have our diode mode. We also have resistance and stuff like that. Key note is, is that resistance, diode resistance, all that is tested with the board unplugged. There's no voltage going through it. And we'd use the DC voltage mode when we actually have it plugged in, plugged into the tester, running the test, and then we can test the uh, voltage. The reason why we do the diode mode is to make sure that hopefully that chip is seated properly. If it's out of range, we have to go and rework it till it's back in range. Using the resistance mode, you can always test different components in that circuit, compare it to another board, and see if there's an actual problem in that area. Maybe it's a resistor or something like that. So yeah, these are the main things we use with our multimeter. Voltage, diode resistance, and resistance. We're using our variable power supplies, as, as we saw, inject the power of the hash board themselves. But you can also use it if you have like a secondary power supply and inject voltage in certain areas. You can also do the same thing, like steal the voltage from the LDO and inject it into the domain to try to see if that fixes the signal. We showed you all the different kinds of test jigs to use, so you just want to get comfortable with using those. So again, the main components, you have your capacitors, your diodes, inductors, resistors, and a lot of the other specialty ICs, or integrated circuits. Capacitors usually aren't very important, they just kind of filter the frequency. I've seen many times that the board will still work without the capacitor in place. It just really depends on where it's at. Diodes, you want to make sure you're actually installing the right way. Some of the bigger capacitors, you have to make sure they're on the right way, but other capacitors, like the smaller ones, are universal. You can do either way. Yeah, here's the main circuits and components on the hash board. Kind of going from where the signal comes in and goes back out. So you have your power terminals, that's what powers the board, your positive and negative terminals. And you have your IO data port. That's what sends all the signals back and forth between the board and the hash board and the control board. From there, you have your DC to DC voltage. So that's what changes your voltage and on the board. So it powers the entire board from there. Those are the IO data ports. These are level converters or level switches. Um, some, some of the newer boards, they have them. Basically, they're just transforming that 3.3 volts into 1.8 for the rest of the board to use. That's coming from your control board. And we also have your PIC. This just stores all your voltage rate information, kind of communicates between all the chips. Those are the bigger ones on there. Then we also have an EEPROM, so that stores all the board data. Some of the older boards actually used a buck diode that would step down the voltage, and that would be inside the DC to DC circuit. So that's what you see on the S9s, L3s. And we also have your MOS chips or your MOSFETs. Those are basically just used as a gate to open and close the, the voltage through the hole, or at least the rest of the board. 
And those are controlled with a transistor or a triode, as you can see there. So from your DC to DC circuit goes to your boost that steps up the voltage. So you want to make sure that that voltage is actually working correctly. That's used to actually power the last few domains via the LDOs. LDOs just help distribute that voltage evenly across all the different domains, which are groups of ASIC hash chips. Also have our clock crystal oscillator. Here's some photos. So got a bunch of LDOs there. Those are the five leg. Sometimes they're six. Sometimes they're eight. They're bigger. Got a picture of a boost on the left side there. Usually it has a big inductor. And then your clock crystal oscillators, those are just to help to stabilize the frequency of the board. Use kind of like a timer. And we've got the ASIC hash chips themselves. Those are all in groups or domains of two or more ASICs. And then those are powered by the LDOs. Now you usually have about five or more test points for that ASIC hash chip. All those signals go from first chip to last chip, except for one signal. That's the one that goes from last chip to first chip. And we also have our temperature sensors. So all that data goes through from last chip to first chip, collecting all the data, including the temperature sensor data of each ASIC goes through in series to the temperature sensor, collects that data, keeps going through all the chips and all the temperature sensors out to the control board. So on the top there, you have two different kinds of temperature sensors. And then you have three different kinds of ASIC chips. These are amp miners. All the signals are around that 1.8 volts, except for two of them. And those would be the you got clock. That's 0.8. And we have EO, EX, EI. That's the heartbeat signal that's going to be zero volts. What's minor is very similar. Same thing, 3 over 1.8, clock 0.8, CTSI is that zero volt or heartbeat signal. So when we're diagnosing the hash board, we want to make sure we remember there's three basic issues that occur with these boards. So you have the zero ASIC, the sum ASIC, and then some other kind of error. So when we're doing zero ASIC, we don't know where to start, so we usually just plug it in to the test jig, test the voltage, see where that break and that return signal is, go from last shift to first shift. If there's any issue on that 
somewhere in that last domain, test your LDO. Maybe the LDO is not putting out enough voltage for that domain. From there, you check your boost, find out the boost is not supplying the proper voltage. Maybe you'll find out that the MOS is not opening, so you're not getting your voltage into the boost. So basic, we kind of know exactly where to dive in at, so we want to test diode resistance first. We want to do the chip that says sum A6, so 5A6, we test chip 4, 5, and 6. Then we just want to rework any of those chips that are kind of out of range. Always do our visual inspection. Maybe there might be a resistor capacitor that flew off or got corroded. From there, if everything looks good, we can always plug it in and test voltage. But in this sense, we're trying to make sure that all the other signals are going from first chip to last chip. Again, it can also be the LDO or lots of other issues. Maybe one of the chips has a low voltage and it's just enough to pass the current. Then all the other errors just kind of want to Troubleshoot if it's the temperature sensor, figure out which one it is, rework that area. Could also be that ASIC chip that's right next to it in series. Take a reprom, try to reprogram it, compare all the different components to another board. Maybe it's a capacitor or resistor, might not necessarily be that main IC component. Another common one is maybe all the voltages are there. Just want to actually make sure it usually might be that first chip, or it might be the clock crystal oscillator, that circuit. You can always use an oscilloscope to see all the different signals to see if it's actually working properly. This just kind of goes over basic practices when you're soldering. Just want to make sure you're melting all the solder evenly. You don't want to have like a few pads that didn't melt and you have like a pseudo solder. You want to make sure you set the heat gun just right. Might even be best to take a, a practice board and find that sweet spot for the, the temperature, the airspeed. Different technicians like to hold the gun a little differently, so it really depends on your own preference and what works good for you. So these S9s are a lot more giving. Some of these other boards, you got to be very, very careful because you can burn the board really easily. Last thing you want is, is you fix the board, but you said, you know, look at it, it's got a whole bunch of burn marks all over it. We already found out about all those uh, pesky small components. That was fun. Yeah, just getting really good practice on working those kind of components makes it a lot easier. Yeah, there's just a really big difference between doing cold soldering and hot soldering. You just want to get in the practice of trying to do more of the hot soldering. We can bring the board's temperature up to temp and then put the component down, maybe even do a little pseudo solder, heat it some more. Um, just makes it so it's not so stressful on the board or the component. Especially once you start doing heat plate work. It's just so much easier to be able to actually work the components while everything's melted.
Do some different temperatures on what you can use for the different kind of temperature of solder. Just really depends on the board. Again, it's better to start at a lower temperature and then build it up until you find that sweet spot. That way you prevent damaging the board and the component. And then again, when you're doing the heat sinks, we always do the heat sink that's on top of the heat sink first. And then we do the bottom heat sink. And then we can rework the ASIC. Same thing when we're reattaching them. We want to let that cool. Attach the back heat sink. Let that cool. Attach the top heat sink. If you have to use heat, let that cool. Important with like the 17 series, you use solder on top, so make sure that solder doesn't overflow onto the actual feet. That's why it's better to use flux first, there's usually enough already on there. You also want to make sure that all the thermal is as even as possible, especially with the ones with like grease. So when we're reattaching it, it can be as simple as you didn't have enough thermal grease on that one chip. Yeah, just um, remembering the three R's, or what I like to call is rework. So we're reflowing the chip, melting everything with flux. If that doesn't work, replacing, uh, reseating the components, so we lift it up, inspect the pads, add and remove solder as needed. And finally, we can always replace, swap the chips. You know, definitely want to make sure we have a reason to why we're replacing that component. We always want to double check, verify it. Is it because the voltage isn't passing through? Is it because diode resistance was off? Maybe compare that to another board, maybe the resistance is good. Also use you know flux intermittently, heat it up, remove the heat, add more flux, come back in. The diode resistance, I mean the main reason we're doing that is, is if the value's off, the value's too high, usually means we have an open circuit or too low, we have a short circuit. So ideally we're just trying to isolate the problem, we're just following that signal, trying to see whether there's a break, or there's something that's out of range. We're always making sure that that return signal is going from last ship to first ship. From there we want to make sure that these signals are going from first ship to last ship. Whatever it says on the test jig, like some ASIC, you know, 21 ASIC, doesn't mean it's chip number 21. Doesn't always mean it's going to be chip number 22. We want to make sure that we're testing at least before and after. And ideally, since we know where to start, we're doing diode resistance. It's also important to always test other domains, especially if you're in doubt, you can always go over to an identical domain and test and see if you have the same uh, readings.